The Night Beat starts right now. It's almost one year since that horrific tragedy on Quintana Road. Dozens of migrants found dead in a tractor trailer. Tonight, those migrants are being remembered in the form of a new book. The construction chaos concluded. You're looking at a live picture from the St. Mary Strip where the city says crews are laying the final layer of asphalt. But is the construction really almost over? The construction crews are working overnight tonight in the city of San Antonio. A team out on North St. Mary's Strip right now laying asphalt in what they are calling the final stages of that construction project. As we know, it's taken years for the city to finally say that an end is in sight. Our newest reporter, Avery Everett, is there now asking the city how close crews really are to wrapping up, Avery. Well, paving this part of the St. Mary's Strip is a long-awaited project. Come take a look at some of the crews out here. They're finishing up the final stages of this project along the strip. If you drive this road regularly, you know cones and construction have really become a regular over the past two years. Now shops along the strip say it's time to build business back up. Buzzing means business to Daniel Garcia. This is where we print our shirts. On the inside of 621 screen printing, it can get pretty loud. And we have a um, uh, kind of a robotic machine. But the outside is even louder. We've, we've seen a lot of businesses come and go and uh, a lot of construction, but not this much. Construction on the North St. Mary Strip project began in 2021. What businesses here thought would only take a couple of months ended up lasting years. It's hard to recover from that. Construction crews are supposed to be laying the final asphalt this week. Wider sidewalks and more parking spaces are all part of the 2017 bond project, finally being finished in 2023. We're real close. We are real close. The city says an end is in sight, but businesses on the strip say damage has already been done. Normally you wouldn't want traffic coming through your neighborhood, but we want it. The city says expanded plans and old infrastructure caused longer construction times. Garcia says from his window, it's always seemed slow. After a while, you just got a sense of this, this project's gonna take forever. Garcia says all he can do is stay positive. It's going to help this area immensely. Printing and packing and waiting for street traffic to finally turn into shop traffic. Now moving forward, the city is hoping to fix some of the communication issues with construction projects across the city. They're looking to build a portal to directly communicate with residents about any project updates. I asked about a timeline, and they still haven't decided on that just yet. Reporting live, I'm Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Avery, thank you for that. Another news now, a big relief for the Texas families who've lost loved ones to fentanyl. Many of those families surrounding Governor Greg Abbott today in Austin as he signed four bills into law aimed at fighting fentanyl. The measures raise awareness about the drug and also changes how we teach kids about the drug and prosecute the people who sell it. So now here's the breakdown. Again, I said four laws. We'll start with House Bill 6, with charges drug dealers with murder if they sell fentanyl to someone who dies from an overdose. And then we have House Bill 3144, which officially makes October Fentanyl Poisoning Awareness Month, and that's aimed at raising awareness about the drug. Then House Bill 3908, which requires public schools to teach 6th through 12th graders about the dangers of fentanyl. And finally, we have Senate Bill 867, which allows colleges and universities to distribute Narcan. That's the medication that stops someone from overdosing on fentanyl. Now, for years, families have been pushing for these laws because they claim that they're going to save lives. Now, just a reminder that the opioid crisis is something that the KSAT team has been following for you for months. If you want to find out more information about fentanyl, how it affects your body, you can scan the QR code that you see on your screen, and it'll take you directly to the Fighting Fentanyl section of KSAT.com. And there we have a collection of stories that show the dangers of fentanyl and also what's being done to stop the epidemic. Allstate Insurance is actually suing two dog owners involved in a deadly dog attack earlier this year. That suit filed last month and it asked the judge to release the company from any obligations to pay the victim's family in this case. Christian and Abilene Moreno are being sued by the widow of 81-year-old Ramon Nahara, 
who was attacked and killed by the Moreno's dogs back on February 24th. The lawsuit seeking $1 million in negligent claims and the Moreno's have asked all state to provide a defense. All state actually claims they aren't obligated to provide coverage under the Moreno's current policy, which was issued in Christian's father's name. Both of the Moreno's also face criminal charges in this death. Free no more, less than a week after his two capital murder charges were dismissed, a Bear County teen back behind bars for the same crime. Christian Belmudez was rearrested today, six days after his murder charges in the January shooting deaths of Gabriel Sanchez and Sine McNeil were dropped. The case was dismissed last week after the DA's office told KSAT that there was insufficient evidence and the case needed further investigation. But new evidence presented to the Bear County DA shows Bermudez actually admitted to being the person seen with the victims on security video the night of that shooting. The Bear County DA's office issuing a statement today in part, quote, in accordance with the law, our office will now revisit the capital murder charges against Mr. Bermudez in light of additional details and evidence obtained by SAPD. Upon indictment, our office must then have enough evidence to convict Mr. Bermudez beyond a reasonable doubt. The Bear County Criminal District Attorney's Office remains committed to ensuring a fair and just legal process for our, all parties involved. As the legal process involving Christian Ray Bermudez continues, we will work diligently to uphold the principles of justice, maintain the integrity of our criminal justice system, and protect the rights of victims of crime." End quote. We didn't do it today. 93 degrees for the high temperature officially at the airport. We have yet to hit triple digits officially at the airport in town. The average, by the way, is 93. Look at the record today, 105. So it shows you the potential. And I do think we'll be turning up the heat a little bit more in the days ahead, and the humidity will be changing a little bit as well. Catula made it to 105 today. Del Rio, high temperature of 103, pleasant to 96. Also, more on that haze. Where's the Saharan dust? Where's it going? What about the smoke in the air? I'm going to get to all of it in just a bit. All right, Adam, thank you. Los Angeles, now the latest city to receive a bus of migrants from Texas. It's one of several major cities around the country chosen by the state of Texas for its, quote, self-declared sanctuary city status. The bus's arrival comes on the heels of Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar's meeting with California Governor Gavin Newsom. Now, the sheriff's office says that they, when they met, they discussed the migrant flights out of Texas with the most recent flights arriving in Sacramento last week. We told you about that. Now, Salazar released a statement on the meeting saying in part, quote, I was fortunate to be in a position to meet and confer with Governor Newsom to discuss our respective cases regarding the migrant flights. Among topics discussed was the status and nature of the criminal investigation. I look forward to further conversations and collaborations with authorities in other affected areas, end quote. The sheriff's office says that the two met while Salazar was in California for a conference. Now, BCSO has filed a criminal case with the Bear County District Attorney in connection with a flight of migrants from San Antonio. The state of Florida at that time was responsible for the September 2022 flight, but BCSO has not yet said who specifically is involved in this criminal case. The suspended state attorney general Ken Paxton's fraud trial will remain in Houston. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ruled it will take place in Harris County instead of Collin County, where Paxton lives. Paxton allegedly got people to invest in stock without disclosing that the company was paying him. No date for the trial has been set. Paxton indicted by a Collin County grand jury in 2015. Multiple shots fired in an East Bear County town in broad daylight. It's happened three times in the last couple of months. The night team's Patty Santos tells us police have a new clue into who they're looking for. Three shootings in two months in the town of St. Hedwig. In the two previous in incidents, they used a nine millimeter uh, weapon, automatic weapon. Um, and the shell casings that were recovered yesterday were nine millimeter casings as well. Investigators recovered 14 shell casings near a tree line along FM 1518 and Greytown Road Tuesday afternoon. No one was hurt, but this latest shooting falls within a few miles of where two cows were shot in April. Similar shootings were reported around the same time near Calaveras Lake. Marshal Mark Soto says this time his team has a small lead. The caller who said that a tan SUV had fired multiple rounds in the area. In early May, a farmer whose cow was shot randomly at night told us 
they were already on edge. So I'm afraid that if they're doing this for kicks, someone's going to get hurt or killed. Soto says concern has grown since then. It worries me because of, of the wanton disregard for public safety. You don't know what's on the other side of those trees. As of now, Soto says no arrests have been made in the shootings. Crime tips can be called in to 210-335-6000. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as small town America anymore. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Now let's talk about an active recall for frozen fruits sold at HEB, Costco and Walmart. The issue is with strawberries that are grown in Mexico that pose a risk for hepatitis A contamination. Now the producer here is the Willamette Valley Fruit Company and it's sold under the brand name Great Value and also Raider Farms. Now we have the lot numbers and the affected packages listed on our website, kset.com. And if you have any of the affected products, just throw them out or you can bring them back to the store and you'll get a refund. It was nearly one year ago that 53 migrants died in the back of a tractor trailer. Now we'll discuss how a new book is leaving a lasting legacy for all of those victims. It's hard to believe, but it's been almost a year since 53 migrants died in the back of a tractor trailer that was found on San Antonio's southwest side. Their lives have been honored in a makeshift memorial. As the night team's Lee Waldman shows us, that is not all that's being done. I look up at the sky and I wonder where are they? Do they see me? For almost a year, Karen Caballero has mourned her sons, 18-year-old Fernando, 23-year-old Alejandro, and his wife, 25-year-old Margie. The trio was among the 53 migrants who died last summer in the back of a tractor trailer on Quintana Road. Caballero spoke with us over the phone, but wasn't comfortable showing her face as she's seeking asylum in another country. I see that the anniversary date of his death is approaching. I see broken dreams. And to share stories. Over the past 12 months, Caballero has shared her children's stories, dreams, and plans for a new life with Sandra Grace Martinez. Um, young individuals that are professionals, you know, having engineering degrees, um, you know, in graphic design. Martinez has made it her mission to learn about all 53 lives lost and write about them in a book, sharing their stories from their families. We also um, have this, this greater understanding, hopefully through this book, that these were human beings that lost their lives. The crosses on the book and the ones along Quintana Road are symbolic of the lives ended by the oppressive heat and desperation for a new life. I'd like to honor the memories of the 53. Who the tragedy fell within City Councilwoman Adriana Rocha Garcia's district, where she says plans are in the works for a permanent memorial. 53 markers is the idea right now with those names and country of origin would be the way to commemorate that. Possibly a plaque as well. Martinez is still looking for a publisher for her book. She says the proceeds will go towards that memorial and for legal funds to help migrants and their families. Now, on June 25th, there is a rosary plan to honor the 53 lives lost. It will be held along Quintana Road where the migrants were found in the back of that 18 wheeler. Back to you. Lee, thank you for that. Now we're taking a live look outside here by the airport, 86 degrees. You can't really see it out there right now, but Adam, before you were talking about haze and also the humidity is going to be a little bit different. So yeah, we'll see a minor fluctuation in the humidity in the afternoons. It's going to be offset though by hotter temperatures. That's the give and take when you deal with rising and dropping humidity this time of year. But the haze, it was noticeable. Some people wondering, well, is the African dust overhead, could that be a part of it? And the answer is actually no, not right now. Take a look at the Saharan air layer or Saharan dust, African dust. It's that time of year. It starts getting transported across the Atlantic from Africa, and it's still far to the east of the, of the lower 48. It will be moving into the Caribbean and then even parts of the eastern Gulf of Mexico this weekend and early next week, but we're not expecting it over San Antonio or anywhere of Texas anytime soon. We did have a little bit of smoke in the air again today. The agricultural burning in Mexico indicated by these green colors. That's a smoke in the air, not at the ground, but higher up a little bit. And notice the low level winds carrying that smoke northward up the west coast of the Gulf of Mexico and into Texas here. We do have the light amounts 
of smoke in the air. So that did contribute to some of the haze in the sky today, but it's nothing like what we're seeing in Canada. That's still a big story with those Canadian wildfires. And actually, Minneapolis, see now this smoke is being pushed southward again into the basically the upper Midwest and Great Lakes. Minneapolis registered their worst air quality on record today. That's surface air quality the records go back to 1980. So that's pretty uh, impressive and unfortunate. Around here we have a frontal boundary and that was the severe weather zone right along the Gulf Coast. But east of us, we're talking from Dallas eastward to Jackson, all the way down to Savannah, Georgia, and now in northern Florida. That's the severe weather zone. They had some mul actually multiple tornadoes confirmed on the ground in parts of the southern deep south US, but that's all going to stay away from us. It's all being blocked by the big upper level high, the big blue H anchored just south of San Antonio, but close enough to be our primary influencer in the weather and it blocks out all the active weather and keeps it away from us this weekend. There's actually going to be a little disturbance off to our north in North Texas and parts of the plains, but we're still too close to this high and unfortunately we won't get in on any of that activity. You look at our generalized rainfall over the next seven days and at least some parts of Texas get it. East Texas, some parts of North Texas, and we could have a few thunderstorms as close as Austin, maybe Brady, possibly even Blanco to Sonora the next couple of days. But I think that's as close as we'll get to any activity around here. So nothing around San Antonio, unfortunately. Luckily, we got a lot of good rain this spring. That helped us a lot. It's also making it humid out there. 86 degree air temperature, dew point of 74. Very, very sticky air in place. And contrary to what's normal this time of year, we're not seeing the dew point fall off in the afternoon. I do think we'll slowly start to see that by this weekend, but again, it'll be offset by warmer temperatures then. 80 in Hondo now, 79 Bernie, 85 Canyon Lake Stinson, still measuring 90 degrees and 92 right now in Catula. We talked about those dew points. They are extremely high, well into the 70s. Very, very thick and oppressive levels of humidity. And like I said, usually the humidity drops in the afternoon, dew points fall, but we're not seeing that yet, partially because of all the moisture in our soil that's just evaporating and adding to this mugginess. But I do think that'll be the trend a little bit in the days ahead. Let's talk temperatures tomorrow. 79 at sunrise, low clouds to start the day. By noon, we're at 86 degrees, starting to clear out again. Those low clouds were stubborn the past few days. I think they'll linger up through noon and then we'll clear out. 100 for the high temperature, right around 100, but it's going to feel like it's up to 107, maybe even 108 around town when you factor in that humidity. Even higher heat indices farther south of town. 102 by the weekend, and as we get into next week, we're talking 103 with a lot of sunshine. By the way, tomorrow is our first yellow day, peak energy demand day. Conserve energy from 2 to 7 p.m. CPS energy, peak energy demand day. You can go to our website, kset.com, for more information. Personally, I avoid using the big appliances between 2 and 7. Then you get out of the laundry, too. Uh, yeah, that's true. A good excuse to not do chores. Exactly. Right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right, coming up, are the Longhorns and Aggies back on in their football rivalry and the latest on our Wimby watch after the break. Just a few moments ago at halftime, University of Texas spelled out Thanks, Texas A&M, and then played thanks for the memories. After a very long wait, Texas and Texas A&M will get to add to those football memories and big board sports. Texas and Texas A&M have met 118 times on the football field. The last meeting was back in 2011, Thanksgiving Day at Kyle Field, and the Horns won at 27-25 thanks to a Justin Tucker walk-off field goal. The Aggies left for the SEC after the rivalry stopped. Well. The matchup is coming back at least one more time in 2024, the Longhorns' first season in the Southeastern Conference. Today, the SEC released its 2024 schedule, and Texas will play eight SEC games, four at home and four away. So UT will host Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, and Mississippi State and play at Vanderbilt, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas A&M. The Aggies are pumped up and released a hype video. Here's a snippet.
Time and date in College Station to be determined, and Texas will face Oklahoma in 2024 at the Cotton Bowl. The Sooners are set to join the SEC, just like Texas. Before the 2023 NBA draft, the Spurs are doing their medical due diligence when it comes to 19-year-old basketball player Victor Wimbanyama. Per ESPN's Jonathan Giovanni, the team's medical staff met with Wimbanyama in France and everything checked out well. Jonathan also said with that out of the way, everything looks to be on track for Wimby to be the number one pick. The NBA draft is rapidly approaching on June 22nd in Brooklyn and KSAT 12 Sports will be there. Later this month, San Antonio's Joshua Franco will once again fly across the Pacific Ocean to face Japan's Kazuto Ioka. They both fought each other on New Year's Eve. The 12 round fight ended in a draw. Now Franco is preparing for the rematch. KSAT 12 Sports producer Daniel Villanueva spoke with Franco last week to get his thoughts on the upcoming fight in Japan. I feel like I'm just, um, it's, it's, it's still a hard camp. I feel like I got my rhythm back ever since the last fight. I feel like I had a little, a little bit of ring rust because I hadn't fought in a year. So I would say I just feel more comfortable and, um, and I'm getting my rhythm back now. Is that what you think is, is the difference in that last fight, considering it ended it in a draw? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, even though I, I feel like I performed well, I just, I feel like my punches didn't land as clean as I wanted them to. So I feel like a little, it, had, it had a little bit to do with the ring rust. Are you a little worried that you would draw, get drawn into not only this rematch, but then another one on top of it, regardless of how it if ends up this time? I'm not worried, but that's that's not what I want to happen. You know, I want to I want to go over there and win, so I could, you know, set myself up for you know another another fight, and um, you know, hopefully somebody and you know another another champion or someone in the in the top five. So I, I want to you know go out there and win, but yeah, I just ha I have I just have winning on my mind. I don't I don't want to get a draw. So I mean, <laughs> if if it does happen, that would, that would be pretty crazy. But uh, I'm not I'm not looking for that. I'm just looking to go and win, and you know, we'll see what happens. Good luck in your rematch. Thank you, Larry. Back to you. All right. Thank you very much, champ. Here's your fight night infos. Joshua Franco and Kazuto Ioka in Tokyo, Japan, June the 24th. This fight is for Franco's WBA World Super Flyweight title, and you can see more with Franco this coming Sunday on Instant Replay. The Texas Rangers trying to end a three-game slide after the break. Let's play ball. Angels at the Rangers tonight. Bottom of the seventh, tied at one. Runner on base for Marcus Simeon, and he brings Robbie Grossman home with a two-run shot to left field, and Texas leads 3-1, to one, that one measuring 361 feet. Next batter is Corey Seager, and he hits a solo homer to right field, and it's 4-1 to one, Texas after back-to-back -back home runs, and Texas snaps its three-game slide, winning 6-3, and the Astros outscore the Nationals 5-4 to four. in Texas league play. The Missions won at the Sod Poodles tonight, 5-2. to two. Now, last night, the Las Vegas Golden Knights captured their first Stanley Cup in France franchise history, beating the Florida Panthers 9-3 to win the series 4-1. And congratulations to former KSAT 12 Sports intern Tina Wynn, who works for an ABC affiliate in Vegas. She was there for the Stanley Cup ride and loved every single minute of it. I love that, and that's nice of you to give her a shout-out. Absolutely, she awesome. deserves it. She puts a lot of stuff on social media. She's doing a great job. Yeah. When was she an intern here? Oh, geez, it's been a while, probably five years ago or so. So maybe like when the Spurs are winning and then she yeah. goes to Vegas and they're winning. Exactly. Maybe she's the good luck <laughs> champ. We need to bring her back. Okay, right. Tina, you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Nice sunset this evening with those Ooh. cirrus clouds. A little hazy out there, but a nice sunset. Here's another view of it from San Antonio. We love your photos on KSAT Connect. Part of the Weather Authority app, by the way. Uh, back to around 100 tomorrow. Ooh, yeah, did that get you? Mm -hmm. Low 100 said through the weekend and 103 by Monday. You know, we're enjoying the pretty pictures, it. and then you show okay, okay. Yeah, I that. know. You should just there ended on the pictures. There we go. All right. That's there you better. go. I like that. Thank you, Adam. Thank Good you night. so much for joining us. Have a wonderful wow. night. Stay cool.